It was 6.30 on the morning of uh, Thursday, the 19th of June, 1986, when uh, Len Bias died. It may not mean anything to you who are younger, but to me, who uh, was just a couple years younger than him, it was dramatic. I am a fan of basketball, love it, play it, watch it, talk about it. Len Bias was the highest recruit, 1986 class. He was ACC Player of the Year twice. He was an All-American twice. He was probably the greatest player to play for Maryland, maybe ever. Also, on Tuesday of that week, he was the first round draft pick of the Boston Celtics in their quest to rebuild the dynasty, the glory years. So when he took, according to witnesses, his very first snort of cocaine and fell over of a heart attack, we would call that a tragedy. In fact, I remember being a young kid in college at the time, and the thing that I thought about Len Bias, having watched him play basketball, I thought, what a waste! All that talent, all that potential, all the opportunity, 36 hours earlier, you're in Boston signing a multi-million dollar contract, and now he's dead. <laughs> That's a waste. And two trials later, months of litigation, those who had sold him and those who had hidden and lied about what drugs he had taken would testify, it was a waste. I wonder if in Acts chapter 8, and that's where we're going to be today, I wonder if people were thinking about another young man, Stephen, who had tremendous potential, had demonstrated faithfulness in the ministry to which he was called, had made an impact in the community, and he was murdered. And so he's lying in a pool of blood, being stoned by his fellow countrymen, and then a persecution breaking out against those new followers of Jesus. I just have to wonder, did they ask themselves, is this a waste? Probably if it wasn't for Acts chapters 8 and 9, we might be tempted to say, Stephen's life snuffed out so short. What a waste! But because what do we find in Acts chapter 8 and 9, we realize it's not that. And that's where you can help me with this morning's message. What's the difference? Young man, potential, untimely death. One is a waste. The other's not. What? People of God... What made the difference? Why isn't Stephen's death a waste? What would you say? Okay. The reason why it wasn't a waste is because of what God did through Stephen's death. How God brought out of that untimely tragedy tremendous growth in advance. His life mattered. And here's my follow-up question for us. In our given circumstance right now, do you think your life is a waste? Why do we evaluate maybe difficult times, maybe uncertain times, maybe things in our past, and we look back at that and we say, what a waste! It's because we don't have the right perspective of what God is doing. So, let me remind us of the entire theme of the book of Acts. Right out of the gate in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we, we get the theme of the book of Acts. You shall be my witnesses. And he names Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. So that just by way of reminder going into this section of Acts, we can remember that our purpose is to bear witness to God's power to save. This is why what we're going through now is not a waste. Because my purpose in this time is to bear eloquent testimony 
to God's power to save. We get to Acts chapter 8. We're going to focus on three lives and two words. The three lives, I call them the bad, the good, and the ugly. The bad we'll meet first. His name is Saul. We're going to learn about what he did following that execution of Stephen. And the good is a man named Philip. Philip was one of the seven, one of Stephen's companions. And as Stephen is taken off of the scene, Philip grows large and fills that and expands the ministry beyond even what Stephen had done. He's the good. And the ugly is a man named Simon. I don't know what he looked like, so I can't speak to his physical ugliness, but I can tell you this. What he tried to put upon the church is one of the ugliest chapters in the early part of the life of the church. So the three men, two words. The first word, look at chapter 8. We are in the aftermath of the first martyrdom in the history of the church. And Acts 8, 1, we don't go very far until we get a theme word of all of Acts chapter 8. And Saul approved of his execution, meaning Stephen's a martyrdom. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all, what's the next word? And they were all scattered. That's, that's one of the two words we're going to look at this morning. The word is used three times in Acts. Twice in this context, once in chapter 11, verse 19, referring back to Stephen's martyrdom. It's where we get the English word disperse. It is this. It is to take, let's, by example, let's use a, uh, uh, seeds. It's to take them in your hand, and, and they're dispersed. They're blown away. They were gathered, and they're gone. Think, think about that in the context of this verse. And they were all scattered. Those thousands who came to Christ knew in their faith because of the persecution and murderous rage of the religious leaders and especially the man named Saul, gone. Throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, that's interesting, isn't that where God had sent, go and be my witnesses? Except the apostles, we don't know for sure. Was it because they had already been put on trial and beaten once that they weren't the subject of this persecution? For whatever reason, many of the believers that formed the church in Jerusalem, gone, dispersed, and that core of leaders left behind, maybe in hiding. We, again, the text doesn't say. It's just everyone is gone, and we were left with just that core of Jesus' followers. Verse 12, devout men buried Stephen, made great lamentation over him, but... Verse 3, Saul was ravaging the church. The word is the word for a, an animal who makes a kill and then just takes the body. If you ever, uh, behind our house is a, uh, a forest preserve and uh, coyotes we hear occasionally. When they make a kill, you hear them howling and they're ravaging the body and that's what Saul is doing to the believers in Jesus Christ. He's ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Some were scattered, others in prison. Look at verse 4. Here's our word again. Now those who were, say it with me, scattered. Those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Now, here's our second word. God scatters, and what his people do is preach the word. Now, let's, um, help me, let me help you understand the word. Uh, if you think preach is like Scott, you study during the week and you write out your notes and you tell us a, a, an opening story and then you make your point and then at the end we'll pray over that and that's true. That's one sense of preaching. That's not what this word means here. And this word is going to be used five times in this context. The, the word literally is to take a noun, good news, and turn it into a go do, a verb. Uh, they good newsed them. I'm good newsing. So when it says here, um, those who were scattered went about preaching, don't think uh, dress clothes, notes, 35 minutes, and then we're out of here. <laughs> Not that you'd ever think that, but I'm just saying. Think, 
I'm going to bring the good news. Whatever way, I, it's a conversation at work, it's over uh, dinner with someone, it's in my family. It's just, uh, it's not the, the method of delivery, formal speech. It's the content of the delivery, good news. And they good news a bunch of people. That's, that's what they did. And so, um, look at verse uh, 5. And Philip, so the, the focus is all of those scattered seeds are everywhere they go, they're good newsing people. And, uh, and then the focus narrows to one of the seven, Stephen's friend and uh, uh, Stephen's companion in ministry, who goes north to a place called Samaria. Now, it may not mean much to us, but to them it would have meant a lot. Samaria had been at odds. In fact, there had been open war between Samaria and Israel for generations. Uh, the civil war of Israel was fought, and in their case, the south won, and the, the nation was sundered, and Samaria was the capital. In fact, often Samaria is the way you would reference the northern part of that kingdom, and, and there was war, and there were skirmishes all the time across the, the, the boundaries, and they didn't like each other, and, and uh, the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians, and they were taken captive, and in response, they brought in a bunch of foreigners, and they planted them there in Samaria, and and the Jews hated them. They were half-breeds and racially mixed. And when Jesus in John 4 is passing through Samaria, a woman says, you, a Jew, talk to me? That was the shock. In fact, so deep was the animosity that when the Samarians, after recovery from the exile, they, they built their own temple, the Jews tore it down. They destroyed it. They didn't like each other. And this is the very place Stephen finds him, uh, that Philip finds himself. Uncertain ethnic relationships, strange place, there I am. That's where the Lord had scattered him. And look at what he does. He went down to a city of Samaria and he proclaimed to them the Christ. And, and that's what he did. And so let, let me stop right here and help us get some perspective on why our lives are not a waste. Let me stop and help us see something that's very obvious in the text about the way God works in my life, and, and it's this. God scatters seed where he intends to reap a harvest. You need to know you're where you are so God can use you. You need to know that. You need to understand when you find yourself in a, in a time of unexpected turmoil, God has us there because he expects to reap a harvest. He's going to do that. And Philip was faithful. And so, verse 6, look at what happened. And the crowds with one accord, love this turn of phrase, paid attention. It's going to be used three times here. And what, what he said caught their attention, and they paid attention to him. And it was being said by Philip. And when they heard him, they saw the si and saw the signs that he did. They listened. They paid attention. For, look at verse 7. Talk about a spiritual outpouring of Power for ministry. Unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. There wasn't just a proclamation of the gospel, there was the, the spiritual muscle to back it up. And just as Isaiah 61 promised, the Lord had anointed Jesus, and part of his ministry was going to be free those who were oppressed by demonic possession and, and spiritual darkness and help those who are lame rise. And Philip is continuing Jesus' ministry here and, and pointing back, hey, Jesus is the one. In the name of Jesus, he did that. And look at verse 8. Love this. So there was much joy in that city. Now contrast that with verse 1. Saul approved of his execution. In eight verses, we get from execution to joy. How do you do that? You recognize that God's purpose for my life is to bear witness to his saving power. And I recognize when God scatters me, he's doing it so he expects to uh, reap a harvest. And so, um, let me give you this, I think, takeaway. All the, all the transition, all the change, all the turmoil, all the turbulence in the church and people dragged off and other people scattered away and, and racial uh, conflict and, and I'm over here now and the apostles in hiding, a lot of turmoil. Here's uh, something I think this 
text teaches us. Remember God's call in times of turbulence. What did Philip do? All this turmoil, what did he do? He just good news to people. Let's apply this. Times of turbulence. Don't answer out loud. I had to give this warning in the first service because some of the women would. Or some of the men. How's our marriage? You know, maybe I'm the only man here, but there have been times of turbulence. How about the kids? You bring those young ones into the home, it's like, whoa, where is the manual for this? And then a few years later, you hand them the car keys, and you're sure like, ah, where are the manual for this? And, and then they go to college, or they graduate from college, and there's going to be turmoil. What do I do? I remember why God has gifted me with these children. I remember God's call. How's your job? Turmoil? Uncertainty? Conflict? You need to get this. I think I want to, I want to free some of us. I want to empower some of us. When we focus on purpose more than on circumstance, this empowers us. I love that Philip didn't spend a lot of time saying, I'm not in Jerusalem anymore. Remember, he had significant ministry there. He was one of the seven charged with caring for all of the widows under the care of the church. And that's gone. He didn't focus on the circumstances. What he focused on was what is God in this given circumstance? What has God called me to do? That is so powerful. I don't have to wring my hands as though I'm a victim of my circumstance. I can say, in this given time of uncertainty, God has called me to bear witness to his saving power. I'll do that even when I don't know what's going on. You want the best biblical example I can think of that? How about Joseph? As a 17-year-old, his own brothers beat him up, cast him into an empty well, had a conversation within his earshot of how they were going to kill him, ended up being kidnapped and sold into slavery into a land he had never been into which he did not, uh, he, uh, of which he didn't speak the language. And how does he feel a month or two or six into that adventure, slave in a foreign land. I can tell you how I feel because the scripture gives us the answer to that. And, or actually it begins with, but God was with him. That's what God does in times of turmoil. And decades later, confronting his own brothers who had stood over him in the well while he cried for help, confronting them, he said this to those brothers. You meant it for evil. Can you complete the rest of that statement? But God meant it for good. Wait a minute. Probably Dr. Hoffman would be one of the few that can complete the next statement. To the saving of this household. Meaning God used the turmoil in Joseph's life to bring about a great salvation for his people. Do we see that in our given circumstance today? This is why Stephen's death is not a waste. This is why our circumstance now are not wasted. Remember God's call in times of turbulence. Just good news some people. Acts chapter 8 verse 9, the focus shifts from the bad and the good and we begin to see not only not only Philip's ministry, but there's, there's almost a competition, like a contrast. With a man named Simon, his nickname is Magus, meaning magic, so we'll call him Magic Simon. And you're going to see throughout this text, uh, through verse uh, 13, 
side-by-side -side comparison. What did Philip do through the power of the Spirit versus what did Simon do through deception and satanic power? And so, um, verse 9, there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic. The root word for magic is where we get our English word pharmacy. And has the idea not only of the dark spiritual arts, but also of using drugs to induce the kind of a state where either I have insight or I am led to believe that about others. And so he was... Uh, uh, this, this just mixture of magic and drug use and opening their minds, and he had completely captivated this uh, town of Samaria. And he had practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. Love that. <laughs> There's a warning, people of God. Somebody says, I'm really great. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> somebody makes the ministry about them. Be careful. This is what we're going to find with Simon, and I'm something great, and look at verse 10, because it's the exact same turn of phrase about when Philip preached the gospel. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. They listened to him. They bought his tapes. <laughs> this man's great. Let's call him great. Okay, oh, great magic, Simon. Verse 11 says it again, they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. By the way, there was something to that, probably certainly a spiritual darkness that had some sort of a hold on the people there. Love verse 12, it's a strong contrasting word. But when they believed Philip as he, and here's our word again, he good news to them about the kingdom of God, listen, listen, and the name of Jesus. That's got to be part of the proclamation. We don't just announce the kingdom of God. A lot of false prophets announce the kingdom of God, this, the kingdom of God, that. We announce the kingdom of God as fulfilled in Jesus Christ, his son. And that's what Philip did. And they, they believed. They, they believed that. And so um, the name of Jesus Christ, at the end of verse 12, they were baptized, both men and women. And so in the New Testament example, we see those who had uh, believed and then they publicly testified in baptism. That pattern repeated throughout. And so that's what's going on here. And verse 13 is interesting. And it's, it's kind of a mild transition that is a red flag to say, pay attention, something's about to happen that's a little unusual. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he con and continued with Philip. Continued means like a puppy following after a, a person just at his heels the whole time. Where's he going? What's he doing? I'm going to be there the whole time. Um, even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip, verse 13, and seeing signs and great miracles performed, listen, listen, here's the contrast, and he was amazed. So Simon's saying, I used to be able to do it, I could fool him, and I knew how the tricks to, to amaze the people. This guy, I can't figure it out. How does he do the miraculous things he does? And so he's, he's dogging his steps, trying to figure that out. And so, um, verse 14, the apostles of Jerusalem heard the Samaria to receive the word of God. They, were, uh, they sent to them uh, Peter and John, who came down and prayed with them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen in any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. And verse 17, of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And so let's, uh, let's talk about that for a minute because if you're much of a Bible scholar, you're looking at that saying, no, wait a minute, hold on. What do you mean they didn't receive the Holy Spirit when they believed? I thought that was the promise of every believer and, and you'd be right. And what do you mean it took an apostle to come down and lay hands on them before they received the Spirit? We don't do that today and you'd be right. And Three times this happens in the book of Acts. It happens on the day of Pentecost when God begins to pour out his spirit and, and all the Jewish people that become Christians. And then here in Acts chapter 8, it happens as the ministry and the gospel expands to Samaria. And, uh, and the apostles are called in as those two or three witnesses to verify this is indeed a genuine gospel conversion and, and to go back and report to the church, hey, God's opening the door of, of the gospel to the uh, non-Jews, in this case Samaritans. And the only other time we're going to see this happen is in Acts chapter 10 and 11. Again, the apostles and others are called as witnesses. And in this case, it's the expansion to the entire world, all Gentiles, all non-Jews. As if to say, during this, and Acts is like this, during this transitional time of the book of Acts, when the church is new and it's growing and there's a lot of new things happening, 
God bears witness to those apostles that he set apart as his ministers and said, now, I'm doing a new work beyond Israel, beyond Samaria, around the world, and you apostles need to have a front row seat to see it happen, and that's exactly what happens here. So, second application we should take away from this in a time of rapid change. You leave Jerusalem, you go to Samaria, there's a miracle working opportunity, the gospel is heard, many are converted, the apostles come see it, heads are spinning, it's going so fast, and so... Uh, I would say this, look for God's hand in times of sudden change. Look for God's hand in times of sudden change. When something unexpected comes up, when it's dramatic, sudden, change, uncomfortable, look for God's hand. In fact, let's, can we review the, the series of applications I made earlier. How about this? Let's talk about not just turmoil, but sudden change. How about that job? How about the promotion you just got? How about the job you lost? That's a sudden change. Hey, many of you are graduating, and uh, if you're watching online, I know a bunch of our students graduated last week and, and will graduate in the weeks to come. Great. That's a pretty sudden change. That's pretty dramatic. Your life is going to change now, and Get married recently, that's going to be a sudden change. It's going to be a dramatic change in life. You've had kids, or you've moved those kids out of the house. Sudden, it's dramatic, life's different. God moves people. Your job requires you to go to a new community, or you're new to our community, and that's disjointing and can be disorienting, it's a sudden move and someone you love died. Um, you have had a huge monetary shortfall or benefit, You've got a lot more money than you ever had before, or don't have two nickels to rub together. Big health change, you're divorced. Didn't want it, here you are. Do we look for God's hand in times of sudden change? Here's the questions we've got to wrestle with. When all of my support and all that's familiar and safe is stripped away, two questions, ready? Now what do I believe? Don't just rush past that question. Right now, sudden change, unexpected, what do I believe exactly? <laughs> Why did God scatter me again? Second question will grow out of the answer to the first. Now, what do I do? Because what I believe is going to drive what I do. In those times of sudden change, if I am absolutely rooted to the fact that God has scattered me to bear witness to his saving power, I am going to be solid as a rock. I'm going to see that God is in this thing. And let me briefly walk you through, in my own experience, six things, six ways I see God's hand in times of sudden change. They're not going to be projected, so if you're a note taker, you may want to make note. How do I sense God's hand working in my life? One, I have a greater sensitivity to his voice. It's amazing how when I can manage my own life, it can be drowned, God's voice can be drowned out by sort of the my plans and the, the cares of this world. But there's a change, some of my support is stripped away, all the crutches are removed, and it's very quiet. And I'm more sensitive to what God is saying to me. So that maybe what we need to do when there's sudden change is slow down a little bit and listen. I have a greater courage to face the unknown. I'm a planner. I like to have my notes ready. I like to know where we're going before we get there. I like to have church-related issues planned out in advance. I just don't think surprises are healthy for a growing church. 
But there comes a time when you just don't know. And as we listen to the voice of God, we gain courage. Times of turmoil, uncertainty, or rapid change, we gain courage saying, you know, I trust God enough to handle what's unknown. Greater courage to face the unknown. Third, greater clarity about the things in my past. You've had that experience, right? I have. Where you're walking through something, you're like, man, I just don't get it. And then six months or a year or a decade later, you look back and you say, that's what God was doing. When Philip is a witness to his friend being murdered, he's probably not thinking, thank you, God, for this. But when thousands turn to the gospel... As deep as his heart ached for Stephen's loss, I think he got a glimpse of saying, I understand something about my past now I wouldn't have understood if I didn't have the eyes of faith to see God doing something in my change. Don't don't waste what God has done in your past. Look back, be sensitive to how he's changing our hearts. Fourth, a greater sense, and I couldn't get it down to one sentence, so I'm going to give you two here, but it's the same thought. I have a greater sense there is something more. In other words, a greater sense that this change is only the means to a greater end. Okay, don't don't get stuck in the uncertain time. Recognize God is moving us through a time of uncertainty to get us to a place where he's gonna do something terrific in our lives. He's gonna reap the harvest from the seed he scattered. Get that. I'm hearing God's voice. I'm sensitive to those things. When I begin to get a sense, God, I'm not sure, but I know you're doing something greater. And I love those moments when it's almost in the quiet of your own, maybe your own quiet time or a conversation with a godly trusted friend. You're like, okay, I'm not sure what, but I'm sensing God's doing something greater here. And and I will be faithful during this time until we get to that promised place. And a fifth I have a greater impact on my sphere of influence. Philip had a very faithful ministry of serving the widows in Jerusalem. But because of the dramatic change of the persecution and the uh, Saul's uh, ravaging of the church and because of the unsettling being driven away, Philip's ministry didn't decrease, it expanded. As you and I stand, as we trust God through uncertain times, We begin to build for ourselves a platform where others say, you know what, I don't know how you do it, but I want to learn from you. God begins to expand your sphere of influence because of your faithfulness in uncertain times. Don't don't miss that. You don't get there when you turn and run from those times. Sixth, and I think... I think six is the destination. Like This is where God wants us to be when there's rapid, uncertain, unexpected, or maybe uh, change out of our control. We have a greater trust in God's goodness and power. Let's just get there. Don't understand, not sure how long, but God, I trust that you're good and you're strong, and so I don't have to worry about the other stuff. And that's how I know that's how I know God's at work in my life. And let's wrap it up here quickly, the end of chapter 8, because we, we, we've had just the hints. Now let's give you the actual unfolding of a pretty wicked plot in the history of the church. Verse 18, the, Simon has been dogging Philip's steps the whole way, and he observes that as Peter and John, by the authority of the apostolic gift, they lay their hands on and they... The Spirit of God takes up residence in the lives of these new believers. Some, we don't know, but somehow there was evidence of that. Probably it was speaking in tongues. That happens throughout the book of Acts. As, as you are going to make, baptize, and teach disciples of all nations, you're going to need to learn to speak that language, and that's likely what happened in Acts. And Somehow that there was an experience, and, and Simon's like, whoa, I now know how they're pulling this off. And so... Uh, Verse 18, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. See, dirty people, they just, that's all they see. Hey, if I give you a bag of silver, lay some of that Spirit stuff on me. All right, I'll trade you. And uh, saying, 
give me. It's, it's all about him, isn't it? It's interesting he doesn't ask for the spirit to be given to him. He asks for the power, magic authority. That's what he's looking for. Give me this power so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. I don't want the spirit, I want the power over the spirit. Kind of a magic incantation, that's the idea. Love Peter's response. Peter immediately seeing the threat of trading silver for spiritual power. In the history of the church, the trying to buy spiritual offices called simony after Simon. I want my son to be an archbishop. Here's enough money. Okay, your son can be archbishop called simony. It grows out of this little event here in verse 20. Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you. Okay, you and your silver go to hell. That's the idea. Very strong. Very strong. It's very blunt. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. The word matter there is the word for message. You don't understand the gospel at all. And then look at what he says. Your heart is not right before God. Verse 22, repent of this wickedness of yours. Pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. Verse 23, Peter says, I see something about you. You're in the gall of bitterness. He's referencing Deuteronomy 29, where it said, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, follow a false God with me. Follow a false God. We'll just make it our secret. He said, that's a bitter man. and You warn that man, and that's Peter's doing exactly that. You're in the gall of bitterness. You're in the bond of iniquity. You're so tied up in your own sin, you don't see straight. That's the idea. Verse 24, Simon's answer is so weak. So weak. Again, it's all about Simon. He doesn't evaluate the uh, the, the darkness of his own heart. But pray the Lord for me that nothing of what you said may come upon me. I'm not sorry. I just don't want to get hurt by any of this. Love where verse 25 ends. When they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, that is the apostles, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. That's again that word, good newsing. Many of the villages so just started in the capital city, it spread out the whole area. So, third thing I would say, third thing I would say to us about times of rapid change and growth, and the first two were very positive, but let's. Let's be careful on this. I think we're prudent to understand the scriptures. Be careful of hidden agendas in times of rapid growth. A lot of change and turmoil in your life, and certainly there's rapid growth in our church. We need to see God's hand in that. We need to make sure we understand why God has us in this time, but we also need to be careful and thoughtful to recognize there are other agendas at work, and that was certainly Simon's case. Let me invite Dr. Hoffmeyer. Dr. Hoffmeyer is one of our elders to come up here. I think Dr. Hoffmeyer is a perfect illustration of what's going on here in Acts chapter 8. Dr. Hoffmeyer has for 30 years taught Old Testament and archaeology, both at Wheaton and now at Trinity. And he told me a few weeks ago, or actually maybe it's been a month or so, he has tremendous, really, opportunity of a lifetime to go and train pastors in a place that he's never been and I probably couldn't find on the map. And it's, it's exactly this. God is expanding. What's happening in Samaria in this Acts 8 is happening around the world now and One of our own, one of our elders has an opportunity to expand that. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing, and then I want to pray for you as we close this service. Yeah, some time ago I was invited to come to Mongolia to uh, teach pastors and church leaders there. And uh, in case you don't know where it is on the map, it's north of China and south of Siberia. And uh, I I didn't know much about, I still don't know much about Mongolia. I know there's a Mongolian grill downtown, but that's that's about it. (laughs) But in any event, the exciting thing is that in 1990, that's 25 years ago, there were five known believers in Mongolia. Today there are 60,000. The church is growing very quickly, and it's very important in this early stage to uh, train pastors, leaders for the church. So June 5th, I'll be flying a long trip, 14 hours plus four more hours to get there. I would appreciate your prayers for that. It'll be a very intensive time of teaching for uh, a week. Uh, My wife thinks too intensive. 
for an old man in my advanced condition. But in any event, uh, 18 lectures, uh, six days straight, no days off, uh, all with translation, so that's always a challenge too. So I appreciate your prayer for that. From there, I'll be going then to Taiwan, where for a week I'll be teaching uh, in the China Evangelical Seminary uh, for, again, pastors, future leaders uh, in the area of uh, Southeast Asia. And then on to Hong Kong for a week, where I'll be teaching with two other colleagues. And there we'll be teaching uh, a week intensive class for pastors from the unregistered or underground church in China. Uh, God is doing great things there too. Right? Um, you may, I read this recently, you may have read it too, that there are now believed to be a hundred million believers in China, while there are only 80 million members of the Communist Party. So these pastors are, many of them are second career people, they're doctors, they're engineers who felt the call in their lives, who are actually pastoring now but have very little training. Mm -hmm. So it'll be very exciting to come alongside these uh, friends and, and work with them to help them to build their churches. So I appreciate your prayer. From basically June 5th through the end of June, a little over three weeks, I'll be gone and really do value your prayers. So I'm going to pray for you now, and then when I'm done, will you pray for us? It's kind of the close of the message. Obviously, a lot of folks in this place of change. So we always appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Offmeyer also will be preaching here on the 5th of July. I'll be looking forward to that because he's going to update us then on what God has done on that time abroad. But uh, let, let me pray for you, Jim, here. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your work in Dr. Offmeyer's life. Lord, just the calling to salvation and then the calling to serve you over the years. Thank you, Lord, for putting his uh, sharp mind to use for your kingdom. Lord, I pray for the opportunity that he has now to train pastors and people in ministry uh, all around Asia. God, grant him safety as he's requested. Grant him good health as he goes. The stamina and energy it takes to be able to uh, just offload a ton of information that will be very beneficial. And then, Father, I pray for their protection. I pray for the protection of our brothers and sisters around the world, particularly in Asia. Father, I pray that you would uh, continue to bless the, the uh, preaching of the gospel, the good news there. Lord, I pray that Dr. Offmeyer would continue to have a role in that happening both here and around the world. So bless him in every way, I pray. Protect his team, his journeys there and back. And Lord, fill him with your spirit so he can provide the kind of spiritual power, direction needed to really bless your people around the world. Thank you, Father, for the growth of the kingdom all around the world. Help us to always remember your great power in our lives too. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity we've had to gather together today to worship you, to hear your word, and to enjoy uh, fellowship with brothers and sisters. Now, Lord, it's time for us to be scattered, to be scattered to where you've placed us, in homes, work, situations, schools. Lord, we pray that we would take with us the message of the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. Lord, encourage us, help us to be faithful, where there are those who are struggling with even fundamental questions of faith that you would work in their lives to bring them to a strong relationship with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for this day and for the challenge and the opportunities we have in the week to come that we seek to honor you. Mm -hmm. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman.